Welcome to the French Wedding Podcast with your host Naim, the only podcast in English about weddings in France. Great conversations, tips and insights about your French wedding, some wisdom before your big day, and the opportunity to hear wedding professionals actually living and working in France, only for your day to be the most amazing to remember. Hello everyone and welcome to the French Wedding Podcast. Greetings from France, this is the place we're recording this show. I'm Naim, professional ceremony officiant based in my hometown Paris and I created this show especially for future brides and grooms willing to get married in Paris or anywhere in France. Each episode is an occasion to meet a main actor of the industry, can be a vendor such as a wedding planner, hair and makeup artist, bridal salon, videographer, venue owner, bloggers, you name it. This show exists to bring you some insight about how people do things in France regarding the wedding industry, but we also share funny stories, things to know, and special memories when we happen to work together on the very same wedding. Today, we're flying to California to have a chat with Alison Joseph and talk about her business, Bob Gale, a full service event planning, design, coordination, and production company based in Los Angeles. Together, we've gone through her background of public relations in a world-class hospitality business in New York City. And I've also been fascinated by her great knowledge of Europe. So without further ado, please welcome Alison on the French Wedding Podcast. Alison, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today and be with us. Uh, let's do a bit of geography to start. You're talking to me from Los Angeles, California. That's correct. Uh, we're talking today about your company, Bob Gale Events. How did you get started? Bob and Gale are actually my parents. They founded the business as mm -hmm. musicians. Um, and we still actually have a, a quite an active side of our business called Bob Gale Music that does music for events. I came on board about 18 years ago to do the event design and planning and production. I came by it pretty honestly. Um, obviously, I was born into the right business, which is a lucky thing in a family business. Took a few different paths throughout my career and ultimately felt like it was time to come back and be part of that business and make it my own. And so my parents have actually since retired Okay. Um, so the second generation now runs it. Okay. So you started with uh, with them as a family business and then Correct. you took over and did it on your own, actually. Yes. Yes. Great. And what is your background? What did you what did you do? Um, so I start I will tell you my first wedding I did okay. on my own. I was 15, which oh, is wow. very young. I couldn't even drive myself to the wedding, <laughs> but I um for some reason the clients had a lot of trust in me and It, it sort of caught the bug there. Uh, but I did always want to have a huge focus on education. So um, I did do weddings and events all throughout um, my formative high school years. I would leave from soccer practice and go do a wedding. Um, and then I went away to college um, to Washington University in St. Louis and studied romance languages oh. <laughs> and women and gender studies. <laughs> Nice. Um, because I sort of already knew what my career path would be. So I really wanted to focus on just things that were interesting to me. And because destination weddings were something that were always in the back of my mind, um, I really wanted to hone in on those skills. So I did that. And then I actually went to get my master's at NYU in media, culture, and communication. And part of my studies there were actually abroad in Paris and in Italy. Okay. And then um, after that, I took an internship with Danny Meyer, who is uh, kind of considered the authority on hospitality in New York restaurants. An amazing person <laughs> that that I obviously heard of. Uh, yes. The owner um, also of the, of the Three Michelin Star in Madison Avenue in New York. 11 Madison Park. Yes, mm -hmm. he actually sold it a few years back to the um, general manager and, and chef. But they, it was such a, when, when I was working with him, he did own it. And it was an incredible formative experience. And because hospitality has always sort of been in my blood and I, Danny always makes this argument that you have this hospitality quotient or mm -hmm. you don't. And I, you know, if you are someone who can't imagine doing anything other than hospitality, then that's the right path for you. And I knew pretty quickly that I would have a really great education there. 
and I really, I, I soaked it all in and took in as much as I could. I worked in house for him at Union Square Hospitality Group doing uh, marketing and PR for the restaurants. And it was really so wonderful. He was an incredible person to work for. And what I loved, one of my favorite things about Danny is that he doesn't claim to know how to do everything himself or be great at everything himself. Mm -hmm. He is good at what he's good at. <laughs> and he, surround him, he surrounds himself with people who are better at the things he's bad at than he is. And I think that's a great way to run a business. And so I, I've really taken that to heart and really tried to make sure that the ways that I'm weak, I have people around me who are strong. That's amazing. I'm like, I, uh, I also have a background of hospitality. So I'm kind of curious of how was it to work day to day with such a legend? Because I obviously know who he is. I think the beauty of Danny is that he is extremely humble and has absolutely no ego. And I think that he, I mean, he sits every new hire down, whether it's a dishwasher at the restaurant or an intern coming in and he knows exactly who you are. He knows why they hired you. And he meets with everyone one-on-one, -on -one, gives them a copy of his book, setting the table, which is sort of like the, you know, the, the Mecca of hospitality information. He explains what he sees about you. That would be a great fit for his, in, his company. And, you know, for me coming in, you, you land at JFK, his face is on signs when you get to New York. He is a, a very big name in the New York scene if you know food, mm -hmm. but he truly cares about each and every person. And he carries that through not only to his staff, but also to his patrons. And I think that's why he has such a huge following that people that go are regulars because it feels like home. And that's what he wants for his employees. And that's what he wants for his patrons. And I think that that's something that I really take to heart with our events as well. I want people to feel that every event that they're going to that we produce is a dream scenario home created by the hosts of the event. That's very interesting. So this great experience, I guess, with Danny Mayer in New York kind of forged the vision that you wanted for Bob Gale events. It did. And, you know, I, I was raised by really hardworking, gracious, soulful people mm -hmm. who, you know, made, ha they had a very similar ideology to Danny. And so it's something that's easy to recognize if it's something you're raised with. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it was great background for a combination between my parents and the legacy they created, which, I mean, our business has been around for a very long time and, and it's hard to walk down the street in Los Angeles without being stopped by someone who know my parents, whose wedding they did, who they know for being part of a lot of their lifetime moments. And so for us to sort of keep that legacy going, you know, and, mm -hmm. and to foster it too with what I learned at Union Square, I think was sort of a perfect marriage. Amazing. So what happened after that, after being a PR for, for this great company? So while I loved marketing chefs and food, and I have quite a love for food and, and actually what I, part of what I studied at NYU was, um, was food and beverage with the James Beard Foundation in Italy. But I wanted in a, instead of marketing other people's creativity I, I felt like it was time to continue forging my own I've always been a designer and a very creative person and so I it just felt like I needed to move forward in my career and and be able to hone in on that skill set right so what was the next step after that so I left New York what year was that 2010 <laughs> <laughs> now I'm trying to remember right. 2010 and while I was in New York mm -hmm. and in St. Louis for school I was flying back and forth to produce events which is you know an interesting mm -hmm. back and forth because you kind of live this dual life yeah. where you're a professional and you are a student and sort of creating who you want to be in the world. And so I think it was a great way to think about my life and to come to everything really thoughtfully. When I was in New York, I did write my master's thesis about the wedding industry. So I really wanted, instead of learning about the what in graduate school, I wanted to learn about the why and why people behave the way they do and how sort of dynamics in society make people want to celebrate these occasions and, and spend on these occasions and be together and plan together. And so I think uh, it was time to put all of the things that I learned to use. And so I moved to Los Angeles, jumped right in. I actually, while I was writing my master's thesis, I was pr producing the Amgen tour of California. So I would wake up at six, go to work, be there all day until around 7 or 8 p.m. 
mm-hmm. go home, eat dinner, take a nap, and then wake up at two in the morning to write my thesis through the night. So, you know, also I was in my early twenties, so I had a lot of energy and (laughs) no family yet. (laughs) So you just, um, you know, I I think if you want something, you have to work for it. And so I think it was a very interesting thing to be able to write that in the middle of actually living it. So it was, it was a great combination and I jumped right in and, and was able to sort of make the business my own. My parents were really wonderful about saying, this is your legacy Mm-hmm. make with it what you will. And so we rebranded, we redid the website sort of right away. When when I came back, they sort of let us run with it. Right. And Katie, who's my business partner and my sister-in-law, actually, mm-hmm. she met my brother working with us uh, 16 years ago. He and I took the reins and, and made it our own. And they really took a step back and let us do that. That's really good because it's uh, often uh, to have a legacy is a big responsibility, but it's not enough to be successful. You have to run it and make it your own. Absolutely. And owning a business is not for the faint of heart. I'm sure you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have to, it's, it's so much love and energy and work. And it's, it's like having a child. I can, I am a mom. I can say that it is like having a child. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's it's one of those things that if you don't live and breathe it, you shouldn't be doing it. I totally agree with that. And what's the story behind you speaking four languages? <laughs> so as I said, you know, in school, I really just wanted to study what I loved and go from there. I took some great trips with my parents growing up. And I remember being frustrated that I couldn't communicate. I My master's degree is, is in communications. Communication is extremely important to me. And I just wanted to be able to to hold my own in the world and communicate and read and absorb. And so I first started with Spanish and I learned that in high school, Mm -hmm. but I I took every Spanish class that was offered to me and then that was it. (laughs) There was nothing left. And so I moved on to French, got a good handle on that. And then I went to school and I specifically looked for programs for undergrad where I could either find a program that existed with a language heavy background, Uh or I could make my own. And so I went to Wash U in St. Louis, which is extremely academically focused. They let me make my own major. So I created a a curriculum, which still exists today. Mm -hmm. That was, it's called Romance Languages and Literature. And you uh, get to study all the literature and cognition and, and poetry and all these beautiful things about each culture. And so I was able to sort of lace it together. And it was a really incredible way to see the world. After ironically, they wouldn't let me travel abroad in undergrad because they wouldn't let me take French in Spain and vice versa. So the first thing I did in graduate school was was do a program abroad in France, in Paris at AUP. Nice. Did you like your trip? I loved it. Paris is such a special city. Mm-hmm. And it, to me, it really does feel like home. I just think there's this beautiful way of life there that is so different from how we live in the U.S., Mm -hmm. where people truly like take a moment to enjoy and learn and exist. And I think here sometimes that gets lost. And so I'm glad that I was able to sort of take that moment to myself and study and hone in on things that were interesting to me. And it was a great way to see academia too, because we were, had this great opportunity to be lectured by people from all over Europe. And AUP is a great program. So it was wonderful. Nice. What did you learn? What's the best memory you have on your time here? One of the things, this is very silly, but one of the things that I love the best, the most about France. So in the summertime, I always wish for more hours in the day here. I, I, you know, that's a very American thing to say, but Mm -hmm. I always wish for more hours in the day. And in France, you get more daylight. (laughs) So (laughs) um, even being in class for eight hours a day, which we were, I would go afterwards, I would go for a run through, I, we lived in the seventh and I would run around uh, Paris to see different parts of the city. And then it would still be light till 10 PM. So we would be able to go out and, and be together and have a drink and have a great meal. And it was just like this beautiful way of life where it was slower. And I think part of that is because you have more hours in the day. Yeah, we found we found the perfect way, the perfect spot in the in the planet to uh, to evolve. I really like the way you're talking about France. I lived uh, sometime in Los Angeles back in the time. This is what I discovered about um, American people, especially in California, is that you are reminding people from France, like me, French nationals, that we are having actually a great great country, not better or worse than any other, but a special one. So I really like the way you're describing it. Thank you. It was a very amazing experience. I encourage everyone, if they can, to take some time abroad and and be able to broaden their horizons. So coming back to 
Bob Gale Evans. Can you drive me through the, the process of a destination wedding preparation? Because in general, I guess, brides or grooms, they don't know where to start. So I think there's such a beauty to be able to create a destination experience for our couples. And a lot of the way our couples look at it is that it's just creating this dream vacation for everyone to be together to celebrate their marriage. And usually we start with sort of a geographic location. And if they don't even have that in mind, we'll just ask the feeling that they want. And we're traveled enough, well-traveled enough to be able to give some insight there. Mm -hmm. So we usually narrow it down uh, to some ge geographic locations. And then we usually take a trip ourselves okay. without our clients to give some options, research some options of venues and vendors. And then we bring them back to our narrow down list and present all of the things that we have in mind for them. And that can be activities for the guests, rehearsal dinner location, ceremony location, reception location, just every little detail that we have put together. And oftentimes we're sourcing vendors locally. We, we try to do that as much as possible. Sometimes we'll travel with certain key vendors like a photographer or an event designer florist. We work quite a bit with Mindy Rice and she does a lot of destinations with us. She does a beautiful job of sourcing local things. And so it just depends, but usually we will present all of these options to our clients with a combination of a tasting and design meeting. And then we do the rest electronically with our clients. Sometimes it requires us to go back, sometimes it doesn't. And then for the event itself, we go out usually about one week prior to prepared welcome amenities and finalized details. Mm -hmm. And we really serve as a full service concierge throughout the event. And we do partner with a travel concierge as well. They help guests book travel and transportation. And we really are the liaison for everyone so that it really does feel like a vacation, a full service luxury vacation. Yeah, you're not only uh, producing and planning the day, uh, the wedding day celebration, obviously, but you're also taking care of all the in-between and uh, stuff to deal with regarding the preparation of the trip and the bookings and all of that, right? Exactly. And there's quite a difference when you're booking a hotel wedding and a chateau or a private estate. And so we really like to take a step back and see what the person wants to create. If they want all of their guests in one property, how many people can sleep in that property? Are there different price points? Are the clients subsidizing or are guests paying for accommodations on their own? There's a lot of different factors. And so we really kind of dig in with our clients and, and make sense of what it is that their vision is and create something unique to them. And usually when we're doing a destination wedding, there are multiple events. So we try to give a combination of touch points for people to gather and meals and, and events and activity options. But we also give the guests time to explore the city on their own, which we think is really important. I agree with that. Yeah, definitely to include some time and relaxation and uh, just something not really planned exactly. in the middle of that. Uh, I think it's a good idea. And we think a lot of people's urges are to over plan during some of these mm -hmm. week events. And so we, again, we, we do those touch points, but we really like to combine it with, we, we give options for activities, but we like people to have time to explore a museum that's off the beaten path. Or if they want to go out to Monet's house, but the client doesn't necessarily want that to be part of their weekend, we, we let them know the times and can organize transportation, but it's not something that's formal. People, do they know what they want most of the time or do you feel like you're more guiding them through stuff that you know before, you know, or you just tailor it to the, to the couple, a unique way to do it? It's always tailored for us. Our sort of mainstay in our ideology as producers is to really take cues from our clients' personalities and intricacies. And that's what's beautiful about our job is that none of our events are truly the same mm -hmm. because it's really about the client. So every moment of the event should feel true to who this couple is. And so, you know, we did a wedding for a, a couple and the bride was from Rome. And I, I've lived in Rome. I have extensive knowledge of the city, but she has a different perspective because her family is there. Mm -hmm. And so she's going to have favorite restaurants that maybe nobody has ever heard of unless you're a local And that's something we really want to dig into. And yes, we can give recommendations, but it really just depends on the client. We have some clients who we've done weddings for that they've never even been to the destination before our first scouting trip with them. And they'd want to host their wedding there because it's just this dream of theirs. And then we have other couples who 
have lived in the place or have family there. And it's a very different experience. Yeah, definitely. Well, you just go ahead and talk to them. A lot of meetings, I guess, or maybe not too much. And you just know what they want, basically. Yeah. It's about, again, communication and, and really listening and being able to offer our expertise based on what our experiences are and our knowledge, but also understanding how to create that vision for them. Great. And how would you describe your style at work? Because everything you say makes a lot of sense. But what I also like about playing events like this is that at some point you have to be like super organized and straight and, you know. So I am a collaborator. I really think that it takes more heads than just one to make something great. And so we really like to collaborate with our partners, our, our vendor partners and creative partners to get their expertise in the mix so that things shine as brightly as they possibly can. So we can design the most beautiful event, but if it's not lit properly, it's not going to look right. And the vibe isn't going to be right. And the ambiance isn't going to be right. And while I know quite a bit about lighting design and power, mm -hmm. no one knows more about it than the lighting designer. So it's more about, taking your knowledge and mixing it into a pot with all of the beautiful collaborators that we get to work with. And then that's where we get the best product because I don't think any person can do things alone as well as they can together. Yeah, I really, really like this point of view because it makes a lot of sense and reminds me what you were saying about Danny Mayer previously. I think that successful people surround themselves with people smarter than them and some other topics. Uh, I think it always makes produce a good result. What is the best compliment you ever received at work? One of, so one of the best compliments is that our clients tell us that we deliver what we promise. And I think that that's really important because it's one thing to give a vision. You can make a beautiful event, but if you don't run it properly, it's not a success and vice versa. So I think that's, it's as important to be a great designer as it is to be a great producer. And I feel like sometimes that gets lost in the mix in our industry. So I think it's really a huge compliment when someone says that we can do both successfully. And another, one of my, the biggest compliments was more of an action. Uh, we had a wedding call come in and spoke to the client. And actually this was years ago. I was getting married on that date. So mm -hmm. I said, I'm so sorry, we're not available. <laughs> no. I'm getting married that yeah. day. And so the client asked if she changed her wedding date, if we would still be available to do it. Wow. So, and that's <laughs> happened more than once. We've had several clients change their wedding dates so that we could produce their events for them. And that truly is the biggest compliment. That's true. Yeah. That, like, that sounds like a big, big reputation of quality and service. People adapting to you means that, yeah, you're already in their hearts and they just want you to say yes. Yeah, and I, for that particular wedding, I postponed my honeymoon so that I could make it happen for her. There was no way I was not going to help wow. her. Wow. Beautiful. What made people choose Europe and especially France for their wedding destination? I'm talking about American in that case. I think that there's such a romanticized view of Europe in the U.S. and for good reason. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is this beauty of the slowness of pace and not even just the traditional American wedding in a ballroom in the, not that ballroom weddings aren't beautiful. We do so many of them, but being able to sort of live in a world where things are older and there's more history mm -hmm. and yeah. there's a lot of romance to that all by itself. This is the feedback that you have, or is it the vision that you have also as an American person? I think it's both. <laughs> yeah, even with all your European experience, because you lived in Paris and you lived in, in Rome. Yeah, I think some of the beauty of Rome, especially, I think, is that you're walking by and you're going to a restaurant and you look over and there are these ruins that have been there <laughs> since <laughs> yeah. the dawn of countable time. And so <laughs> I think that, and you're drinking water from aqueducts that were built so many years ago. And so I feel like there's such beauty to that. And I think that Americans maybe can't always put their finger on what they love so much about About European cities, but I think that's a huge part of it. I think it's that there's a history there that we don't have here and, and we're a newer country and that's okay, but mm -hmm. it's not quite the same. There's not that level. And so when you're standing somewhere that has been there for thousands of years to get married, knowing that 
so many couples before you have stood there to get married. That's really special. I really like the way you're saying it because for us, it's kind of normal, you know, and it's good, <laughs> it's good to have also that for us, it's a little bit the opposite sometimes. You know, you're going to America and everything is fresh. Everything is uh, looking forward, you know, like not, not too much history. Quite interesting this, uh, this point of view. Talking about the future, do you have plans for Bob Gale uh, events? that you want to share? I think so much of what we do is ever evolving. I, I'm always planning. It's the nature of my world. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is just being able to be inspired by our couples and digging in more and more into the industry. And I think a lot of it is a combination of education through learning and through teaching. I think that's a huge part of what my future is in the industry. Is there a quote you live your life by or that you think of often that you want to share? There are a few. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, you're prepared. Um, All right, good. <laughs> well, I mean, one of the quotes that my parents have always lived by was, happy are those to dream dreams and are willing to pay the price to make them come true. So you can have big dreams, but if you're not willing to do the work, they're not going to come to fruition. And I think that's important because I think a lot of people, especially in a certain generation now, feel like the dream is enough mm -hmm. and it's not. And I think we're seeing that in the world stage now where we all have a dream of a better world, at least in the U.S. That's a, a, and in the middle of Los Angeles. I live in the center of West Hollywood in the middle of everything that's going on right now, right in the epicenter. I think you have to do the work. You have to do the work to make the world a better place, to make your business better, to make yourself better. Yeah, it starts with uh, what you have inside of you. But, uh, Absolutely. Yeah, that's for first one. I really like it. Now we'll go ahead with the second. <laughs> This is something, it's sort of more of a joke that I tell to our staff, but mm -hmm. you know, so much of our job is problem solving right. and making the best of a situation. And we always tell our, our team, if the number one job requirement is, can, you know, is stress management. If you can manage a stressful situation well, then you're on your way. And so we always tell them when the world is on fire, dance around the flames. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> disagree with this one since I started my uh, work experience in hospitality. And this sometimes I can relate. Yeah, I can relate. Definitely. Um, we're going to wrap up with this beautiful quotes. Alison, is there something that you want to share today with uh, our audience? So we would love for any of the listeners to be able to have a free consultation with us and we're happy to give a little bit of guidance on your events. All right, great. I will put the websites on the show notes for people listening. This is bobgale.com and uh, thank you so much, Alison, for taking the time to speak to us today and sharing your time between Paris and Los Angeles. Thank you for having me. Hey guys, thanks again for listening to the show today. You can find more information on our guests in the show notes, as well as my contact and my website. If you have any questions regarding your French wedding, I'm happy to help. Also, please do not hesitate to leave a review for the show. There's also a link for that. That will literally take one minute of your precious time and will mean the world to me. I always appreciate your support. Thank you again very much for your time and feedback. Wishing you a great day or a great night anywhere you are in the world. I send you some good vibrations and we'll talk to you again soon for a new episode. Bye-bye.